Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be here with you uh, for about 15 minutes, I think. Um, we've had a very interesting um, the symposium this morning on um, Japanese English, well, uh, to be short, the, I mean, covered <coughs> wide range of subjects like uh, intonation, rhythm, pitch, and uh, what else, the uh, syllables, and so on. And much of what I'm going to say from now uh, is somehow related to the topic covered this morning. <coughs> um, to be Frank with you, I was a little surprised this morning, you know, to listen to the uh, presentation. Uh, um, most of you are Dai Nippon no Dokumin this name. You are aiming for the first class country in the world, economically and politically, and so on. And yet, why should you? I mean, downgrade your goal of teaching and learning English, I wonder. See? Mokyo wa up in the sky. And we have to do our best to educate your primary and middle high school students, you see, to reach the goal as near as possible. If you reach, if you achieve about 70 to 80 percent, then your job is done. But if you lower from the beginning your goal to say 60, 70 percent, then where would you end up after the education? Right? I would assume about 40 or 50 percent. That's what you get in the end. And I think it's rather, you know, um, undesirable <coughs> sort of uh, tactics. Uh, Professor Park, who came to Nagoya with me, could you rise and say hello to the audience? <coughs> he's, <coughs> he's my ex Tishi. Uh, he did a PhD under me at the Seoul Daigakuno Gengo Gakka and uh, he's a professor of English uh, language with special emphasis on uh, English phonology at Chungbuk National University. <coughs> so he's been deeply involved in English education in Korea and he knows the, you know, the horizon of Korean English education. And he's been, he served as president of um, English Education Society for a number of years as well. So I checked him during lunchtime whether the Korean professors and teachers of English say the same thing, that is lowering the goal of English education, lowering the goal of teaching English pronunciation in Korea. And he said, no, I've never heard of that. Uh, neither have I heard such a story in my life in Korea. And um, that's why I'm saying I'm a little surprised this morning. You know, Japan heading for the first class nation in the world. Why should you be so timid in setting the goal for education of English? I'm not in a position to say more about that, so I'll stop there. Um, that I think is sufficient. Um, you have a very long history of phonetic studies in Japan. See? The Phonetic Society of Japan has um, history dating back to what? 
Mr. Sensei Juno, almost 70, 80 years, isn't it? Hmm? And uh, you have a um, number of, I mean, the able beneficians, some of them uh, dedicated their lives to teaching English, teaching English pronunciation. Ooh, well, so much for that. Um, my Jetroma, this, if I were you, if I were you, if I'm one of Japanese phonetician or linguist, I would, um, you know, set the goal as you had done well before, that is, before the war or soon after the war, and then find out ways and means of achieving best results in teaching English pronunciation rather than um, sitting back and lowering your goal from the start. You have the manpower, you have the technique, you have everything. And why should you, <laughs> you know, sit back and do nothing? Well, back to my paper. I'm very pleased to meet you all today. I would like to thank Professor Masaki Suzuki uh, of EPSJ for inviting me to Kobe, Japan to deliver this talk. The purpose of my talk today is to draw a kind of practical roadmap for Japanese learners of English. Roadmap is a popular word that, you know, nowadays in military, political field. And I think it's also applicable to uh, phonetics and linguistics and language teaching. There seem to be a number of pronunciation errors, some of them very serious, more serious than others, typically made by Japanese speakers learning and teaching English. I have already given a series of, series of lectures myself in many cities of Japan on the typical Japanese mispronunciation of English of the years. But pointing out the difficulties, difficulties encountered by Japanese speakers is not enough. We've been, we've been, this is what we've been doing, you know, in Japan and Korea. Just pointing out the errors and difficulties faced by Koreans, Japanese, in speaking English. It's like uh, medical doctors pointing out, diagnosing the, the source of, you know, gyoki, illness. What we now really need to do to help Japanese speakers of English is to give them practical tips practical methods which can guide them to the goal. In other words, a step-by-step -step practical roadmap is badly needed. Not only in Japan, in Korea too. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that Korean and Japanese are the two most closely related languages in the world. To my mind, no other languages in the world are closer than <coughs> Nihongo to Gangoko. And now there is more and more linguists and scholars realize this undeniable fact. Korean and Japanese languages are similar not only in grammatical and syntactic structures, but also in their native vocabulary. I'm not going into that because of the limited time. Despite this striking similarity between Korean and Japanese in grammar, syntax, vocabulary, etc., the phonetic difficulties encountered by Koreans and Japanese in speaking English are by no means the same. See. In fact, the Koreans are in a slightly better position, I think, uh, than Japanese speakers. 
who find, who find it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to get the English vowels and speech rhythm right, just to uh, limit two you know, kinds of errors. What then is the matter with Japanese English? You all know this. There are many well-known scholars here, including Professor Soeda from Fukuoka. I'm delighted to see him again. Uh, we met in uh, 19, 2000 in Fukuoka when I gave a lecture there. Before going into details, let me illustrate <coughs> typical Japanese mispronunciation of English in the following passage. English passage in orthography. This passage appears in the Professor John Wells' book of Practical Phonetics, which I've been using in my uh, sophomore phonetics class for a number of years. Um, do I have that? Good, good. Now it starts with, ladies and gentlemen, in a few minutes we should be arriving at Glasgow, and so on. No need to read them all. And a typical Japanese English pronunciation would be as follows. Move on, please. That's right. Sorry, it's... Uh, some letters are not legible because of the um, machine interface problem. And uh, you would know uh, what I'm trying to get across by this transcription. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few minutes we shall be arriving at the Grasco. Please pass on your seat belt and Ex extinguish your cigaretto, etc. No one in this classroom will pronounce this passage this way. But students and school children you're going to teach will start like this, right? And um, <clears throat> unfortunately, some of the school teachers and even professors have some of the traits of this kind of errors. Many of them I met all over the world, England, France, Poland, Japan, United States, etc. Okay, next page please. Factors contributing to such pronunciation errors are vowels, consonants, prosodic features such as stress, duration, and pitch, speech rhythm and intonation, etc. Today I will try and point out three most common pronunciation errors by, made by Japanese speakers of English and suggest some useful tips, that is, roadmaps, for them to follow. And they are vowels, stress, rhythmic patterns, three, syllable increase and resyllabification. Some of them already talked about in detail. Now, <clears throat> we have um, in the next page English-Japanese vowel correspondence table. Let me hasten to present the following table which shows the vowel inventory of English, Korean and Japanese. We can get a good picture here of the kind of phonetic correspondences we can expect among the three languages. You see, there are 12. It's based on British English. There was a talk about which English to adopt for English education in Japan. British or American or Nihonshiki uh, no Eigo Boka. Australian, and then Canadian, Irish. Um, I have a, one story to tell concerning this. Um, I think this morning the uh, American type of English was 
preferable uh, the speaker said uh, well I, I you know agree with such proposition basically and um, because the um, there's a saying trend in trend in Korea we had the World Olympic in 1988, about 16 years ago. You had one well before that in Japan. <clears throat> and there was a heated discussion over what type of English to adopt during the Olympic Games for, you know, processing the Olympic Games for the, um, you know, people involved in the Olympic uh, <clears throat> games of various kinds. Majority of Koreans speak American type of English nowadays. But the, the results of the specialist discussion uh, pointed to British type of English. Why? In terms of number of speakers spread all over the world, uh, speakers of British English exceed in total number the those of American English. That's why. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> in olden times before the war, Second World War, Neon NHK Hoso, so she Beijing no Jugok no Hoso, Koksai Hoso Minna Kono British English de Hoso Shimashita. このトレンドは日本でもう50、60代、70代、初めまでそうでしたと話題、私記憶します。You had a very strong sort of uh, recommendation from the Harold Palmer, who served at Mungusho の英語教育の舞台さ。before the war. That, I think, was one of the reasons, you see. <coughs> right, uh, now looking at this uh, chart, uh, it's based on British English, as I said. Uh, one, two, three, four, as in the seat, sit, set, sack, card, caught, cord, caught, full, fool, cut, curd, and as in ago, the shua in twelve. Now, in this table, the italic symbols, which is underlined, represent the Korean and Japanese vowels, which are phonetically quite similar, interchangeable, quite similar to the corresponding English vowels, whereas those in brackets, only rough equivalents, which are habitually substituted by the Korean and Japanese speakers. <coughs> Thus, only five Japanese vowels, which is E, E, O, U, A, are comparatively close to the corresponding English ones. On the other hand, we can see that as many as nine Korean vowels show close correspondence to English ones. That's why I said earlier Koreans are in a slightly better position, you see, in uh, teaching and learning English. I have uh, reclassified these, the uh, uh, English and Japanese vowels into the following five groups according to their affinity relation to Japanese vowels. The five groups are number one, group one, E, you can see it's underlined, meaning it's fairly close to English vowel. Number two is uh, tense and max vowel, E and E, which is not underlined, meaning it's not quite close, especially the second one, E, the last one. Number three, the same. Number four, which is O and O. Number five, five group five, A, A, E, E, A. These five vowels are represented by Japanese A. 
R has, Japanese R has a very, you know, heavy burden. It, it has to uh, substitute, you know, five English vowels. We talked about intelligibility, acceptability, and so on, communicability. They're all, I mean, quite all right, you see. But the question is, how can we guarantee acceptability in, and intelligibility, etc.? If students taught by you cannot make themselves understood by native speakers, in most cases, not distinguishing these vowels. The English vowel A of the group one um, is the only vowel which corresponds very closely to Japanese A in phonetic quality. English A, U, O of group two, three, four are also close to Japanese E, U, O. However, English A and U and O of group two, three, four are quite different from Japanese vowels i, u, o. Now, the most serious problem, most serious problem is posed by the group five vowels. <coughs> Let's look at group five again, which is a, a, e, e, a, which are represented by one of the same vowel a in Japanese English. The five vowels of the group five may be further divided into two subgroups, that is 5.1, number 10 vowel and number five vowel, a, a, and 5.2, a, e, e. Now, Japanese vowel a is reasonably close to English vowel number 10, a, and number five, a. Well, phonetically, there is difference, but still acceptable, I would say, acceptable, to be generous. But Japanese A is phonetically far apart. It's quite different from the English A, E, and E of the group 5.2. You see, this is the, um, the main point here to increase, improve your intelligibility or acceptability, you have to do something about it. You can't just leave it aside, you know, and do nothing. Then I'll say, professors of English and the teachers of English in high school, middle school, give up your job, teaching job. Why should you teach in the class? Let me come to practical roadmap one. The, I said, you know, earlier on, it is a case of most serious phonetic under-differentiation. Under-differentiation. There is a, a, a. Now, you pronounce cat as kato, using a vowel. And bird as battle, the same album. Long, long ago, you say long, long ago, right? So the one of the same vowel is used here and there, omnipotent. Nowadays, ubiquitous is a famous word related to computer world, and Japanese R is ubiquitous in that sense. So the first thing to do, I think, is to do something about central vowel, the number 11 long uh and uh. I mean, they are practically, you see, the same vowel, central shaw vowel. But they are different in some respects. Especially the uh, 12 vowel, number 12, there's a wide range of phonetic differences according to the context, depending on the context. 
But basically, they are interchangeable, I think. So, roadmap one is something to do with sensual vowel uh, and uh. See? As can be seen in the grouping of English Japanese vowels, the vowel number 11, uh, and 12, uh, are those most commonly mispronounced by Japanese speakers. The trouble is that the Japanese speakers substitute the Japanese R for number 11 and number 12. In other words, they use a fully open central vowel R for the central vowels. Examples, curve, pronounced cabo, bird, bago, learn, learn, turn, tan, yutan. Purpose, purpose. Again, and uh, again, Canada, Canada. Now, this is the roadmap, that is directions one. I started by saying it's no good just pointing out the errors, the diagnosis. You have to teach them, you have to drive them to the right road, see? And the, um, I think it's, I mean, I'm almost, I mean, oh, really difficult to, you know, teach this world to Japanese. Uh, it's also difficult for Koreans, you know. But Koreans have the back vowel, ah, ah. It occurs in Korean language, ah, uh, which is somewhat similar to schwa, uh, not quite the same. Well, this is the Korean era, but I think it's acceptable. But in case of Japanese, it's totally unacceptable, you see. Um, if Koreans say curb for curve, English and Americans would easily understand them. But if you say kabu, Japanese way, no one would. That's the problem. Intelligibility nil, see. Um, now, this is the direction I've been using in my phonetics class for Korean students and some Japanese students, Chinese students in Seoul. That is one, close the mouth with the lower and upper lips. The point is closing the mouth, the clenching the teeth almost completely without opening them. And then pronounce Japanese ah in that position. That is, uh, and you'll get something similar to schwa. If you keep on, if you keep closing the mouth. Now let me demonstrate again. I almost close my mouth, you know, teeth, upper and lower teeth together. And then just, koyo dasto ne. That's schwa. Very simple. Three, or simply produce voice while keeping the mouth almost shut, as instructed in number one. Keep the mouth shut. Upper, lower lips, teeth, and then just coil. Tas uh, uh, That's proper schwa. With this, you will certainly get about 11 uh, longish or uh, right. The main point of this roadmap is this, point five. Produce voice while gently biting the tip of a finger, making sure that the tongue does not change its shape. Tongue shouldn't move backward or lower. So it goes like this. Just pushing the, you know, the teeth between the upper and lower teeth, and then just produce sound. Uh, that's sure. Mm -hmm. And the question is, you have to be able to use that whenever this sound occurs in English words and sentences. 
Fortunately, however, Japanese speakers need not worry about the world final uh, 12 occurring in words like China, Surfer, Partner, Paper, etc. It is very similar to Japanese uh, uh, word, you know, final. Uh, now, the um, another vowel is a, which I described on the roadmap too. Uh, if I have time enough, you know, I can, we can practice together. But um, time being limited, I advise you just to listen to me and uh, try it later uh, on your own. Another striking pronunciation error made by a Japanese speaker is the English open, uh, front open vowel a, ah, which is usually replaced again by central low vowel a. Ah. Ketto, katto, sado, matto, hago, hago, land, lando. Now, how to correct them? In the class, you should tell the student, keep the mouth almost fully open. Hantai desu ne. Saki, nobeta koto wa zenzen hantai desu. Keep the mouth almost fully open with the tongue tip touching the lower teeth. Lower teeth. But uh, this time, the tongue tip should come forward to touch the lower teeth. That's the point. To bring the tongue forward. You can easily say Japanese ah, 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 but that's not enough. It should be brought forward. Ah, 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 ah. Now you can check this with your finger, you know, uh, by letting your finger touch the tongue and you can touch the tongue with the finger, it means the tongue is forward. Two, pronounce the Japanese vowel R while pushing the lower teeth hard with the tongue tip. If necessary, place your thumb upright between the upper and lower teeth. You'll get the vowel A right in most cases. That is, thumb, push your thumb inside between lower and upper teeth. And press the tongue, you know, hard, and pronounce the sound. Ah, that's a sound. But failing to get the sound uh, right for Japanese students and pupils, they'd better use a vowel rather than ah. In such words and the English pronunciation would be more intelligible. Intelligible, intelligibility, acceptability guaranteed, I can, I can assure you. See, if you replace, if you can't get a right, then use air, which you have in Japanese, air. So that you can pronounce cat, not katto, but ketto. Ketto will, ket will do. Even if it's not cat, ket will be accepted. Whereas katto is no good. Now, roadmap three. I have limited time now. Stress and rhythm. Daniel Jones has already pointed out the difficulty the Japanese speakers experience with the English rhythm in his well known book, An Outline. He said, The greatest difficulty of all is experienced by the Japanese. For them and all others to whom rhythm is difficult, it will be found helpful if the teacher taps the rhythms of sentences with his finger on the table, like that. You know, tap the table whenever you see a stress. The pupil should practice saying the sentence while tapping in unison with the teacher. The difficulty lies, no doubt, as we all know, in the syllable time rhythm that the Japanese speakers are accustomed to in speaking their native language. It is important for you, Japanese, to realize that the stress time rhythm of English is very different from the Japanese speech rhythm, which is basically syllable timed. Jones used the English sentence he wrote to the secretary to contrast English and French rhythms. 
One might add here Korean and Japanese rhythmic characteristics as follows. Do we have the uh, further down, please? That's it. Further down. Yes. It's again not clearly legible, but English is it wrote to the secretary. That's the typical English rhythm. Is it wrote to the secretary. And Korean will say he wrote, just like Japanese, there was a uh, same sort of, you know, the uh, example this morning. Pronoun E at the beginning was was known to have high pitch. Same Korean. He wrote to the secretary. That's the kind of Korean students were. French, he wrote to the secretary. Now, I think it's very familiar to Japanese ears. He wrote to the secretary. Da, 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 da. Same, same length, same uh, stress given to each syllable. So it's like a marching song. Japanese, he wrote to secretary, almost the same as the French. So French and Japanese, they have something in common, rhythmically. Korean but different. Uh, it's lying somewhere between English and Japanese. Now, there are two important points worth noting in the sentence given above. One, there are two stressed syllables in the sentences, in the sentence surrounded by unstressed ones in English, where the syllables are all evenly stressed, unmarked, in French and Japanese. Number of syllables increases in French, and more seriously in Japanese. You are very good at, you know, increasing the number of syllables. It is quite clear from this that Japanese and French speakers share the same sort of rhythmic difficulty in speaking English. And the weak form is another matter. Uh, this is an, another element which um, sort of destroys the rhythm, English rhythm. Now, the road map I, I'm going to prescribe is this, direction one. For a start, try to pick up the dang di di type of rhythm, you see? Dang di di is a strong, weak, weak. This is the, this is the, the um, names I've devised to characterize the strong and weak syllables. Strong one represented by dang and weak one di di. Whereas the dang di, you get weak, strong, weak. If you use the same word, dang, 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 then you wouldn't know which one you are referring to, weak or strong, you see. Um, can you have the, um, um, the alcohol? This rhythmic thing is, um, you know, really, I mean, impossible to teach without introducing musical sort of technique. Um, Japanese people are so used to this silo time rhythm. Even your uh, national anthem is composed as, you know, with the, this silo time rhythm. See? One syllable for one you know, note, you see. Not but Do we have the uh, the try? This is a song, you know. Scottish or Irish song I often use for my English class to teach rhythm. And there we have dang di, 
Dang Dang Di or Di Dang Di, you know, strong, weak, weak, strong, is interchange in a very interesting way. <clears throat> I think you know this song, uh, Coming Through the Rye. It goes like, um, if a body meets a body coming through the rye, if a body kiss a body, need a body cry. Every lassie had a lady named I say, Yet all the lad they smile on me when coming through the right. It goes like that. The point I'm going to get across is this. It's not sung as if a body meet a body coming through the right. Not that. If a body meet a body coming through the right. See the strong beat, weak, strong beat, weak. Or oh, hantai ga de, beat, weak, strong beat, weak, strong beat. It's repeated, see, repeated in an interesting way. Um, this is the one way of teaching the English type of rhythm to students, and they would know. So, kimi ga yo mo, kimi ga yo wa. Well, you see the difference. No, kimi ga yo wa. Now, without this musical, you know, the um, technique. Uh, I think it's well nigh impossible to just, you know, train the proper English rhythm to students. Um, so, this dang di 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 for instance, Sunday is dang di, isn't it? And holiday, it's says misprint there, and also dang Saturday, dang di di. Di dang di is July, potato, September, Dang, di dang, di dang, di. Now this kind of musical treatment is absolutely vital, I think, and it's very, sh it's a shortcut to the education of rhythm. Uh, so I say, page nine, musical approach is strongly recommended. For instance, singing a well-known song, the one I just sang to illustrate, can be a very helpful exercise in mastering the two different rhythmic patterns. Remember that some English words appear in strong and weak forms, and that it's unnatural to use a strong form in the position where a weak form is required. And four, more than anything else, it is necessary to know how to pronounce the central vowel schwa right. Schwa is the central, centralist located vowel, and it's a neutral vowel, meaning uh, it's not on the edge of the cardinal vowel diagram, you see. It's right in the center. Mm. Jugoku people say they are the center of the world, like central show vowel. Now, let's move on to uh, uh, roadmap four, which is syllable increase and re-syllabification. Another important phenomenon which renders Japanese English hardly intelligible, I say intelligible, to native British and American speakers, this is a problem related to syllable increase and re for various reasons. And there were some important points made this morning about <coughs> this problem. I was going to ask why Japanese, uh, the uh, and maintain or continue to pronounce President Bush as the Bushu instead of Bushi. Bushi is much nearer to English. You see, why, why should you so go on not cut the Bushu ni Sunuga Chodeska? Well, Koreans usually say Bushi, Bushi, Bushi de Tongyo, Bushi de Tongyo. And um, I think there's no reason why you cannot, you cannot. 
pronounce this word bush as bushi, right? With our support. Uh, there is something, uh, it's a nagging problem for me. I, I really can't find out the reasons. Perhaps somebody would tell me later. Um, a vowel insertion after the syllable final consonant is very common in Japanese pronunciation of English. Thus, words like uh, bado, sido, kado, garu, well, you know, all this. This sort of vowel insertion is directly responsible for resyllabification in Japanese English, which is just as serious, if not more, as the vowel insertion. For instance, the words given above are all resyllabified in such a way that an extra syllable is produced because of the inserted vowel, as demonstrated by kado, garo, taito. Two, sokuon is another factor contributing to the syllable increase in Japanese English. As internet, the word internet is internetto. How many syllables? In internetto, seven syllables. Whereas in English it's internet, three syllables only. Can you show the um, OHP analysis, please? And the same thing applies to hot dog. Uh, you would say hot dog, hot dog. And film is show. Film, one syllable. Film. Have you found out the uh, the uh, diagram? Now, well, uh, I can say, no, not that, the actual spectrograms. <coughs> Uh, while he's searching through the uh, shio. Let's... Can you turn it across? Uh, this show is film. Just move up, please. Yes. The In the middle is Japanese pronunciation spoken by my Japanese student in Seoul Diagro, Genko Gakka. And the syllable division is also marked. Um, whereas the English is just film. And the Korean will say in two syllables, pillim, pillim, pillim. Japanese, fuirumo. And English film. Okay, the other. Can I have internet? That's it, lovely. Here we have um, uh, English internet on the, you know, on top. Internet, three syllable. Uh, further up, please. Move up. Yes, and you have the Japanese pronunciation. Yes. Internet. Internet. Many so you know, functioning um, here and there. Okay. Now, this is the uh, directions I would like to recommend. How to go about, you know, um, teaching the right sort of uh, pronunciation for these words. One, pronounce CV part of a CVC syllable very strongly. You know why, I mean, why Japanese cannot manage to do this? Because um, you have in Japanese, um, you know, a syllable structure, you don't have the final consonant, that's why. It's, the reason is obvious. So, pronounce the CD part, you know, 
of the CVC syllable very strongly. The beginning, put the stress on the first syllable, the first part of the syllable. And the final consonant as weakly as possible, taking care not to produce any vowel or voiced sound. Number two, pronounce the CVC decrescendo in one beat, that's a musical term, in one beat, you know, decrescendo, from strong to weak, one beat, never in two. That's the idea. Um, sounds easy to, uh, you know, when I talk about this verbally, but uh, it takes hours and hours, weeks and weeks, months and months of practice. And uh, teaching, repeated and systematic teaching. Uh, I think the time is almost up. Is it? Now, may I conclude uh, just my point in very few words? Uh, can you show the cardinal vowel diagram? No, not that, cardinal vowel, actual diagram. Now, this is from a book by a Japanese um, phonetician. Uh, you see, you have the um, cardinal vowel diagram, and within it, the um, Japanese vowel, you see, connecting the five Japanese vowels. And if you look at it very closely, you will know you would come to the conclusion why Japanese people have such, you know, difficulty with English and other, the uh, vowels, you see. You know, there's no A, ah, for instance, corresponding to A. Ah. It's empty in front. And also, there's no proper U, long U, you see. It's, um, it's uh, brought forward, tongue is brought forward. And uh, also there's no central vowel, see? So this tells you instantly what's wrong with the Japanese pronunciation. And um, with some careful thought, you would come up with the um, detailed technique as to how to teach students the right sort of vowel qualities. So, phonetic training, phonetic teaching, phonetic drill, including, say, cardinal vowel scheme, I think it's essential for, you know, school teachers and professors of English so that they can find out the right sort of methodology teach individual, you know, needs. Um, and without that, I, I have, you know, no answer on I mean, what to do, as to what to do. So, please strengthen your phonetic training, phonetic education, so that uh, each professor and teacher of English can devise his own, her own sort of technique. Um, and this, I think, is the only short, shortcut to the right sort of education. Never give up. We can do it, but um, if we lower our object, discard our object, and uh, decide to, you know, to lead mediocre life, then we'll end up being becoming a beggar. Thank you very much.